afternoon. So I'd like to welcome you to the STORE lecture series. And I'd like to begin by thanking the STORE committee and the Animal Behavior Graduate Group uh, for the support for today's talk. Um, I'd also like to call out a special thanks to Sarah Adcock. Sarah, back there. Sarah is the PhD student that CORE has coordinated all of this visit, uh, which has been a, a real investment. Um, so thank you, Sarah. So the an Animal Behavior Graduate student selected our speaker today, Dr. Victoria Braithwaite. Uh, professor Braithwaite is um, uh, she's a professor of, of fisheries and biology at Penn State University. And I've created this word cloud from the abstracts of her papers from 2013 to 2016 to give you an idea of her interests. She studies fish, as you can see, see very prominently, um, and she's interested particularly in the cognitive abilities of these animals and how they develop and respond to environmental challenge. And this work has important implications for conservation in terms of fish survival in the wild, and this is particularly important in our rapidly changing world. She's widely, that's good. <laughs> she's widely recognized as a, as a leader, and we, I just picked out some of these examples of, of awards that she's won. The um, Harbaugh Faculty Scholar in 2014, the Bellis Award in Ecology in 2010. She had a visiting professor fellowship at Bergen University in Norway from 2008 to 2011. The Fishery Society of the British Isles, she, they gave her the medal in 2006, and she's a fellow of the Royal Institute of Navigation. Today, she's just going to be speaking, she's going to be speaking to us about just a sliver of her research. <laughs> um, in which, uh, talking about fish, a pain in fish, and we're fortunate that she's literally written the book about it, uh, so we're, we're very lucky, very lucky to, to have her. Uh, speaking about specifically um, some of the things that she's been thinking about, she's been a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies um, from in, over the last year. Um, and that this has given really her the opportunity to really incubate and, and think deeply about um, this specific aspect, this one way in which um, fish process information in terms of pain. Um, so with that, please join in me in welcoming Dr. Brinkley. So I managed to wear something that was out of pocket today, which was not very sensible. So I'm going to be holding this. If occasionally I forget it and put it down, you might suddenly see me struggling. Um, thank you very much, Cassandra, for the um, uh, kind introduction and uh, indeed to the, for the invitation to be here today. Um, so what I want to talk about um, is why pain has actually evolved to hurt. And so uh, we're, I'm going to be talking about different aspects of pain, um, some elements associated with neurobiology behind it, um, but also think from an evolutionary perspective, what is the advantage to actually hurting from, from something, from damage and, and, and so forth? Yep. There we go. Thank you. I'm going to begin with a slightly provocative uh, uh, piece. This is Marco Evaristi. He's a Chilean artist, he's a modern, uh, modern artist. And in the year 2000, he was invited to put on an exhibition at the Trapholt Museum of Modern Art in Denmark. Um, he decided to put an exhibition on, which he said, of which he said he wanted his audience to wrestle with their conscience. And quite literally, this is what he put on display. So inside these food blenders, which were um, uh, connected up to electricity, he had live fish swimming around in them. And uh, people, if they so wished, could actually press those buttons and blend the fish. The consequence were a number of people who came to the display decided to push the buttons, uh, and not long after the, um, the um, exhibition went on, on show, uh, the director of the Trappold uh, Museum was uh, arrested and uh, accused of animal cruelty, although he was later acquitted of those charges. So there's something rather interesting about this paradigm here, and, you know, many of us believe that there is something inherently wrong with blending a live fish it makes many of us uncomfortable. 
But clearly, it doesn't make everybody uncomfortable because there were a number of people who visited the exhibition who were prepared to actually push the blenders on. So I think it's a rather interesting question about, well, why? What, what is it? Is it empathy gone wrong enough to actually feel something for these fish in terms of this process here? And if, if it is empathy, what are we empathizing about? Are we worried about what those fish are going to be experiencing as, as the blenders may go on or not? So I think in order to try and, and think about what these issues are behind uh, whatever Isto was trying to get us to wrestle our conscience with, boil down to this aspect of pain and what we mean by pain. And I think it's interesting to point out from the beginning is, is that we have been, this has been a conundrum for us for, for hundreds of years. We've been very interested in trying to understand um, for centuries, in fact, what pain actually is. Here is a very old painting from uh, Descartes, uh, from one of his treatises on, um, uh, on man. And in this, remarkably accurately, actually, what he decided here that was happening to this man who was burning his foot um, was that he described this as um, what's happening here is, is that there are pain pathways that are involved. So um, the fire pulls on delicate threads that uh, open up pores in the, um, uh, a common sense here, a common sense center within the brain. And what he, he drew in his cartoon up here was the pineal gland. That's where he thought the common sense parts of, of the brain actually were. So here we have a fairly old dis description of what might be happening during a pain process, during a burning process, where presumably the person in the cartoon there is going to be withdrawing their foot very quickly from the burning sensation. Now, as I say, it's actually remarkably accurate in some ways for somebody who was really in the dark about how a lot of uh, neural processes were occurring, this very idea that there are specialized threads that are maybe pulling the foot away from the damage is really not too far off the mark. As time has gone on, our thoughts about pain have uh, changed, uh, but not as quickly as you may have thought. So uh, I'm at Penn State University right now. This is a picture of at Pennsylvania in the 1860s. Um, and I have to say I'm rather glad that I, although uh, perhaps, as you'll see from the bottom, maybe it's not so bad for me, but I'm rather glad that I don't live in that era now. So our attitudes to pain have certainly, um, and how we manage it, have shifted. And in the 1860s, about a third of all surgical amputations that were performed had no anesthesia and no analgesia, despite the low cost and availability of those chemicals. And there was no very good reason for this, other than it was felt to be unnecessary. So anesthesia was rever uh, reserved for those who were considered to be the sort of most sensitive or the most in need. Um, and this was c uh, these people were whites, women, and wealthy. Um, so yeah, I probably would have been okay back then, but uh, a number of colleagues might not have been. So. Um, so we're making some progress, mid middle of the uh, 19th century here. I'm now going to rapidly bring us up to the uh, 21st century, and I'm going to show you um, this article here, which was published in Nature in 2006. Now, the rem remarkable thing about this is that this is just a few years ago, so a decade ago, and even in this, there were big discussions going on about which hospitals chose to provide pain relief for neonatal uh, preterm babies. Um, so newborn and preterm babies were considered in some cases too young to perceive uh, in the same way that older children and adults do um, uh, the, the pain that might happen because of a procedure that they would go through or uh, the, the lance uh, uh, prick that goes to the heel and so forth. Um, or indeed they, it was thought that if they did experience something they were too young to then go on and remember that. Um, it, this is something that's now changed. Um, so I would now say it's, I, I would think we would struggle to find a hospital where in fact some form of pain relief is, is not provided for the procedures done. But you can see that not that long ago, clearly even with humans, we have this, we have this difficulty. And I think babies present a particularly interesting problem to us when in, for, from my perspective where I'm trying to understand pain in animals because this tiny baby cannot communicate other than cry and maybe withdraw the limb that, that, that may be hurt or affected in some way. Um, so they can't communicate with me in, in terms of language, which you and I would be able to do so that you could actually share with me the experience of experience, um, uh, uh, some procedure being done to you. So, so thinking in terms of here, we have a, a, you know, a, a small human who is failing to communicate with us and we're having some trouble understanding. By the same token, when we try to understand pain in animals, it's the same problem. How can we get into the minds of the animals and really understand what's going on? Um, 
And so again, here we have now uh, from the 1980s, uh, uh, again, perhaps a slightly surprising uh, outcome here, which is that animal researchers, this was a survey done of animal researchers um, in New York City, and they did not uh, consider that post-surgery pain <coughs> relief was necessary for lab animals, even though some of those animals might have been through quite invasive procedures. Post-surgery analgesia was just, it was not a, a routine process. That has changed. And by the year 2000, most scientists agreed that pain relief was an, an important part of the care of the animal. Um, but again, rather uh, surprisingly, we were very poor at what we administered, the chemicals we used, the compounds. Um, anesthesia is something that has really um, seen a revolution in the last decade. Um, and now we are reasonably confident that the post-surgery care and pain relief that we provide for the animals in our care is, is now um, appropriate and much better. So historically, um, we, we, we're sort of against this backdrop of some confusion about what pain is, whether it matters, and to which uh, animals it may or may not matter. So let's have a think then about um, what is pain and why it is that it's such a challenge to study. And first and foremost, what I'd argue, and, and this is no surprise, it's an adaptive process. It's, it's a protective process. Animals that protect themselves are going to be more likely to survive and are going to leave more offspring. So we should, we should see selection here, evolution working hard to uh, select for some um, process here that's going to avoid tissue damage in the future. But it's also something else, in humans at any rate. It is a subjective experience. So it's the feeling that you as an individual also experience associated with tissue damage. So we're beginning to see that, in fact, it's not the simple, straightforward process. In fact, you can split it up into two processes. So there is this first stage <coughs> where nerves in the skin, which are called specialized nociceptors, detect the damage, and then a series of responses will arise associated with that um, uh, uh, detection. And many of these processes are occurring at the level of the spinal cord. And this is why I'm using Descartes' picture again here to show you that aspects of what he has, was saying back then are right. So we get reflex responses occurring at the level of the spinal cord um, right from the get-go when tissue damage occurs. Some of those signals pass up to the brain, but there are other signals that remain below the level of the brain at the spinal cord doing things like withdrawal responses, um, uh, very, which happen very rapidly. The second part is when that signal travels up to the brain and then is moved around different areas and it's processed by different regions. And at this stage, certainly in humans, we have this subjective experience. And that's the bit that hurts, the, the ow, if you like. And we're, aware, we're now aware that something is actually causing us damage and pain. Um, for those of you with children, I apologize about the next picture. This, when I saw, saw this picture, it made me recoil somewhat. Um, this is not what you want your child to do, obviously, with a hot pan of water. But it's here to point out that many of you will, at some point, have burned yourself. Or you'll have had a prick or a sting of some sort. Often you are aware that you have reacted to the thing that has burnt you, so you've moved your hand away or you've, you've, uh, you've, you've, you've reflexively responded before you are aware that it actually hurts. And that's because we've got this two-stage process that is, is occurring here. Um, and I think uh, it's a, I'm going to focus on this two-stage process to um, make the point that it's important that these two stages are actually dissociable from one another. So they're performing different roles and we know um, through some experiments that I'm going to describe to you later that we can think about them as two separate processes. And, that, uh, and, and there are reasons to why that's important. So to begin with, I'm going to talk about nociception, this first stage, and think about where within the animal kingdom we see it. And uh, a big clue to what I'm about to say is the fact that I've already alerted um, you to the fact that it's an adaptive process. So we're going to expect this to be pretty widespread. So here we have a phylogenetic tree of the animal kingdom. You know, where on this are we going to say that nociception um, is, is happening? Um, my best bet is, is that pretty much everything on that picture is going to have some kind of nociceptive capacity. And, and for examples, I'm going to give you, um, I've just uh, taken some circles around some of them here. So we have um, uh, the um, uh, uh, Nidaria here, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, sea anemones. I'm going to talk to you a, a little about some of the arthropods. We're going to uh, move on to mollusks and then on to uh, vertebrates as well. All right, so I'm going to give you some examples of all of those associated with this first part of uh, the detection, the nociception um, associated with pain. Uh, 
two sea anemones here, so these are Cnidaria, pretty simple organisms. What's interesting about um, uh, sea anemones is that they often have territorial wars, so they, they will fight with one another. Um, those of you who have been on marine biology courses may well have actually done this in real time, where you can get the anemones onto little pieces of slate, and you move them close to each other, and then you watch them start to grapple and fight, and lit literally the tentacles come out and they grapple as they try to figure out who's going to win the territory. So th that's exactly what's going on in this slide here. We've got a fight going on. But in particular, what I want you to pay attention to are these white tentacles down at the bottom, around the base of the uh, uh, oral part of the, uh, of the sea anemone. And these are specialized tentacles called aparagi, and they have a very important role, which is that they have stinging cells inside them called nematocytes. And, oops, uh, those stinging cells um, are, uh, are used basically to uh, 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 fight aggressively with the opponent, and eventually one of the individuals will back down and uh, the winner stays where it is and the loser slowly shrugs itself off. So those stinging cells are doing something to, uh, uh, which is causing a nociceptive-like response, which is avoidance and removal, you know, removing the individual that's uh, now the loser away from uh, the scene. I think what's interesting about these nematocysts and stinging cells is that they're so important in the animal kingdom that they're actually recycled. And so we have things like nudibranchs, so sea, um, uh, sea, uh, sea slugs like the one you see here. They're not protected by a shell like many of the other mollusks are. Um, but what these animals will do is they'll selectively feed on the sea anemones and on other corals that produce these stinging cells. And they then export those stinging cells to little sacs on the back here, which are what these orange buds that you can see running down the length of the, the body of the sea slug here. And those are full of these stinging cells and they protect the animal, again, from potential predators. And, and, uh, and, and so forth. So here we have specialized structures, these stinging cells are, are, are there um, to cause and inflict some kind of tissue damage on the individuals um, uh, that are picking them up. Um, and in the same way that we see here, an individual responding to being attacked by these stinging cells, we can see that we have the, uh, you know, a, a, aversive responses actually occurring. We see the same kind of thing in insects. And in fact, this is a classic uh, um, uh, experiment that, that, uh, that is done with cockroaches to figure out what chemicals are irritants. So you can put a drop of something that you're um, trying to uh, score onto the back of the cockroach, and very quickly you see the cockroach lift its back leg and rear it around as it tries to clear the uh, irritant from its back. If it's not an irritant, it doesn't, it doesn't respond in that way. So you get these very specific reflex-like responses to noxious stimulation. So again, this is a, 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 a classic type of Drosophila, also the larva, have been shown to um, uh, uh, have a, a, an aversive escape response associated with a hot probe. So if you touch a hot needle onto the side of a, uh, a larva here, you get a very characteristic spiraling and, and, and um, uh, curling, twisting response, an escape response um, associated with that. Being Drosophila, there are lots of things that we can do here to try and figure out what are the pathways that are actually contributing to that behavior. And uh, fairly recently, um, a mutant was found, which they've called painless. I think that's actually a bad name for it. I think it should have been nociceptionless. And you'll see why I'm going to say that in a bit. Um, but this mutant has a malfunctioning, a, a particular ion channel that's malfunctioning. And that means that when you touch these mutants with the hot probe, they continue to just move on as though nothing has happened. So you've knocked out that nociceptive pathway um, in these plants. Moving on, we can see that even in crustacea, we have very similar kinds behavior here. So if you take a, uh, this is a glass prawn, you take one of their antennae with a pair of forceps and you squeeze, you um, immediately see that the prawn begins to groom that antenna and rub the area which you um, have just damaged. You also see that if you brush a small amount of either acetic acid, so a, a vinegar solution or sodium hydroxide onto uh, the antenna, you get a very classic tail flick response, which is an escape response as the um, uh, uh, little um, uh, shrimp is trying to get away. Uh, and it, but it, on the other hand, if you brush, so it's not a tactile thing, because if you brush the antenna with just seawater, you don't get the same response. So, so here we're getting an escape response, a reflex escape response, very much associated with those noxious chemicals, acetic acid and sodium hydroxide. Now sometimes the nociceptive response, or nociceptive response, can, can uh, be really quite dramatic. 
And that's what's going on um, in the following example. I've got a short video clip here of what happens when damage occurs to uh, a, a, a crab's leg. Um, uh, crab, crabs and a number, number of other invertebrates, and some vertebrates actually, choose to autotomize certain uh, limbs, uh, which means that they shed them, they choose to shed them. And in this case here, you're going to see some scissors going in to the joint here, making a small incision. You're going to see femur lymph pouring out, showing you that the damage has occurred. And then watch what happens. What's going to happen, the action, such that it is, is going to be up here at this part of the crab. Okay? So there you see the incision made. You can see the lymph coming out. And within seconds, the crab chooses to shed its limb just like that. Now, the, the idea behind this is that having damaged the limb in such a way, it's now making a choice about whether it should continue to drag around a damaged claw or whether it's going to actually be better off shedding that claw, growing back another one, um, and uh, uh, being able to, to, to maneuver around as best it can without the damaged claw in place. So it's a fairly dramatic loss that the animal is choosing to make. Now, in the crab industry, uh, there's a lot of interest in terms of uh, harvesting claws. So this would seem to be quite a good way to actually harvest the, the claws of the crabs. And in fact, normally what happens is people, uh, the, the farmers go in and they grab the claw and they, they, they pull it off. But in fact, what I've just shown you there is that they could be clipping it and, and getting the crab, the crab to autotomize. And maybe that would be a good thing, because if we look at the physiological response that's associated with this autotomy, here on the left in each case, we've got, some, we've got three physiological measures here. We have, um, uh, the screen here. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, the amount of glucose, circulating level of glucose, we've got lactate, um, and then we've also, also got time to resume movement down here. So three things that are uh, broadly speaking related to the physiological response associated with having either the crab um, uh, autotomize in green, so it's choosing to shed it here, or in the case of the orange bars here, actually having it declawed, so pulled off. And you can see in each case here a dramatic difference between when the crab chooses to actually shed its claw versus when it's pulled off. So uh, some interesting differences there, potentially. What about vertebrates? Now, I've got virtually, I think, all the vertebrate examples I'm going to give you, I'm going to use fish. And there are two or three reasons for that. One is, is that I think they represent the hard case for ver uh, vertebrates. If we can explain that uh, uh, or, or show experimentally that fish are experiencing pain, then I think it's a pretty good foregone conclusion that most of the rest of the vertebrate group will also be experiencing something similar. So what about nociception in trout, um, or uh, uh, any fish for that matter? For, the, for this example, I'm going to show you a short video clip of what happens when trout <coughs> respond to prey with spines. So um, trout are often eating uh, small invertebrates. Many of those invertebrates have defenses, and that's what you can see um, in, in this clip here. I'm going to show you three short clips. The first clip, uh, it's going to be pretty fast, so if you blink, you might miss it. Um, it's a fish eating one of these regular gamorids, smooth back, really not very difficult to actually consume at all. The second two clips are going to show you these uh, gamorids, which have got these spines on the back uh, uh, here. They're not particularly uh, big spines, uh, but you're going to see in a moment that it does make a difference in how well the fish can consume the uh, prey. So all the trout I'm showing you here, there you go, that wasn't little, what was it? Have been uh, about, the, their size matched, and they've been food deprived for the same amount of time. So they should, roughly speaking, have the same motivation to feed. Now this is one of the fish trying to eat the spiny form. And you're gonna see that what it does is it keeps spitting it out and trying to orient it so that it can get it into a way or a position so that it can actually swallow the prey. So it takes a lot longer to eat one of these spiny prey. And the last clip, which is very short, is where the fish goes after the prey and it obviously touches something within the mouth that causes that response. And despite being in that tank for the remaining 10 minutes, it didn't try and feed on that uh, item again. So uh, a fairly strong response there. Um, so reflex right response, again, we're still talking no deception. We're not talking about um, felt pain at the moment. Um, with the fish, what we went on and did was to have a look within the trout to see whether there are noceceptors that are similar to the birds and mammals, uh, uh, those that, that we see in birds and mammals. And uh, we did this by looking at responses uh, to things like weak uh, uh, acetic acid again, we had a hot temperature probe, and also we had a, an ability to crush the skin, so a mechanical probe. 
Uh, to do these experiments, we had fish that were deeply anesthetized, put into a cradle, such as you see here. Then we had anesthetic solution washing over the gills. So the fish is um, uh, unconscious at this stage, um, but still alive. And we're then able to take uh, recordings, um, civil unit recordings from the trigeminal nerve, the main facial nerve that, that innervates the head and around the um, eye region of the fish. When we did this, what we were able to do is to localize a series of specialized receptors, different kinds that you can see shown here um, in, in different colors on this picture. And just on the left here, you can see that a, a recording of what happens when we dropped a, a fairly weak, actually, solution of acetic acid onto um, uh, one of these receptors, onto one of the um, kind of chemical receptors. And you can see here the rapid series of firing that we're able to detect in the ganglion that we're measuring here um, when that drop of acid has actually gone on. Were you to do the same thing with a drop of distilled water, you don't get the same response. So it's not the physical dropping of the solution onto the face here. It's definitely associated with the noxiousness of the chemical. Uh, this was work that my postdoc Lynn Snedden did um, uh, quite some time ago now uh, um, uh, with another student, uh, uh, Paul Ashley. Um, she also showed that the nociceptors are also found on the cornea of the eye of the, uh, of the fish. Uh, again, an area that's uh, would probably very sensitive for very good reasons. You want to protect the eye, so not surprising that we, uh, that we find nociceptors, uh, specialized receptors on the skin of the eye. What do these things look like when, uh, so once, once those detectors or those receptors have actually picked up the damage is occurring, the information is then relayed within the nervous system through specialized fibers. Do fish have those? Um, yes, they do. So if we take a, a, a preparation, again, from the trigeminal nerve, so in this case, we, we're looking at the lower jaw um, uh, of the fish, so we're taking a, a, a section here um, from that, that main uh, nerve, taking a thin slice through it and having a look after we've stained it at what we can see. And this, the cartoon shows you here that basically the nerve is made up full of fibers. If we look at that through the microscope, this is what it looks like. We get a range of fiber types, but if we look now specifically for the A delta and C fibers, you can see um, in this uh, bit that I've blown up here, uh, slightly more easily, these darker stained areas, these circles here, are the A delta fibers, and then unstained and a little harder to see because they don't actually have a myelin sheath around them, are these smaller fibers, which are C fibers. So these are the two classic fiber types that convey information about and, and that's basically what they do. They're in that nerve fiber to convey these kinds of information. Now, the C fibers have an interesting uh, role because um, being unmyelinated, they transmit that signal more slowly. And so we get a split in the way that pain is actually detected. We have the A delta fibers uh, producing um, a first pain, a fast pain response because that signal travels further and faster because of the myelin um, insulation around these particular fibers. The C fibers produces a second pain, which is a longer lasting pain, um, and, uh, uh, and, and nevertheless and, and, and it is an important part of the process. We also get a lot of chemical kick signals in addition to the electrical signals passing along the C fibers, um, which also mean that the, the, the pain lasts for longer. So uh, there I've shown you uh, just around the snout of the fish, uh, the, the fact that we have these uh, A delta and C fibers. If you look at the tail of the fish, so the back of the fish and the fins, they're also innovated. And again, if we were to take a slice, you'd see a very similar picture to this one here. Now, what's interesting about the relative distribution of the, uh, the fiber types um, is in terms of the, the actual numbers of them and how that compares to terrestrial vertebrates. So here, when we, when we uh, do some quantification, we see that about a third of the fibers in the uh, nerve of the fish are these A delta fiber types, whereas only 4% are about these C fiber types. That's interestingly in contrast to mammals and birds where about 50% of the fiber types would in fact be C fibers. So there's a difference here. And quite what that difference means has been speculated on, and I'd be happy to talk about it a bit later, but I think it's, it's certainly worth noticing that that difference is there. Okay, so uh, how do these stimuli uh, uh, then affect, um, so if, if, we, if we go with an noxious stimulus, how do goldfish and trout with species where we've done these experiments, um, react to this. So, so to look at that, um, what we ended up doing was a series of experiments where we compared the responses of fish to when they'd been treated with a small injection of bee venom. Any of you who've been stung by a bee know that it hurts intensely because a lot of the toxins in that bee sting are, uh, cause an inflammatory response. You get a lot of localized, very rapid swelling of the tissue, and that swelling sets off a lot of the nociceptors. 
Um, the second thing that we did was to use this acetic acid, and again, any of you preparing a salad or anything where you put a bit of vinegar into a cup, or um, lemon juice, for example, it nicks and it stings because the acidic ions in the acid are causing that, they're, they're, they're triggering nociceptors in the skin. There. By way of control, what we um, did was to look at what happens if you inject a small amount of saline into the, um, uh, into the same area, or if we just anesthetize and handle the fish. In order to do these experiments, we, we anesthetize all the fish, um, so they're all handled in some way, and to control for that anesthesia, we had a group where we just handled it. And as you can see here, what we're doing is we're putting it into the snout, into the front, uh, 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 front lips, if you like, of the fish. So what happens when you do this? Well, in terms of looking at uh, suppression to feed, you see that uh, um, treating the fish in a diff uh, different way um, causes a, a, all the fish to uh, decrease the, feeding, the, the natural feeding response. And in the case of our two controls, it takes about an hour before they really feed it. In the group, the way we've given them the venom or the acetic acid, it's closer to 160 minutes. Um, so, uh, so closer to three hours before uh, we're getting resumption of feeding there. Another thing that we observed when we were doing these experiments was that the acetic acid group, and only that group, showed some vigorous rubbing associated with the snout. So after they uh, recovered from the anesthesia, having had this uh, injection in the snout, they then would burrow around in the gravel or against the glass wall, rubbing the snout in the area, rather similar to the way that we might actually uh, rub an effective area um, ourselves. And then finally, another physiological measure that we took was the uh, respiratory rate of these fish. So you can look at this by measuring the gill beat rate in the fish. You can get a background measure prior to the procedure that you do. You can then treat the fish in the different ways and then look at what happens 30 seconds in you know, uh, um, at time, various time intervals after we've um, done the procedure. Again, you can see all our animals are responding to having their animals and treated in some way, but it's the two noxious treatment groups which are responding most uh, dramatically here, and that uh, elevated uh, high gilby breed, um, respiration rate that goes on uh, for both our treatment groups, way and above the control groups, uh, before they all come back down to that background level at uh, uh, time for two in addition to these observations that we made, we saw that the acid and venom treatments are also producing what we call anomalous behaviors, where they're rocking um, uh, 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 on the gravel in many cases, so as they were recovering. We didn't see this in the uh, uh, two control groups. Uh, so sort of rocking motion from side to side. So again, all of the things, that all, the, all the examples I've shown you here, from the invertebrates through to what I've shown you in the vertebrates, could broadly be described as nociceptive responses. So returning back to this, this figure and asking, okay, so where in the animal, animal kingdom do we see no succession? The answer is pretty much everywhere. And again, that's because if these animals didn't have a way of protecting themselves from potential damage that was occurring, they're not going to get very far. So no susception or nociceptive like, like, uh, no like perception is extremely widespread. What I now want to switch over to and focus on is that second bit, the bit of where it hurts. And now I want to think about the effective component and what the effective component might be doing, this emotional component. So we can think of that nociceptive phase as being the sensory component of actually detecting. Oh, I think we can first of us things that. Um, all sorts of instructions here. Hurry this, don't press that. Um, uh, so whereas the, uh, uh, the, the sensory component is very much about uh, the, the, the pathways that are crucial in terms of representing the location, so where is the damage occurring, and the kind of damage that's occurring, so is it burning or is it cutting, for example, or is, or is there some chemical uh, noxious stimulation that's going on. And there's nociception also encodes things like the intensity of the damage that's actually occurring. So nociception does a lot on its own. What it's not doing is actually um, uh, influencing the effective uh, component, so how unpleasant that stimulus actually is, and how much it bothers you in terms of the hurt. So now what I want to do is to think about, okay, so which animals are capable of this bit? And in a way, that's the bit that really matters when it comes to thinking about, for example, animal welfare. Because it's this bit that leads on to potential suffering in the animal. So if an animal is in chronic pain, it's suffering from that pain if there's an effective component that is actually associated with that. So how, how are we... Um, uh, going to try and, and, and think about which animals might actually be um, experiencing this pain. Now, what 
What typically has been done in the past, and what I'm going to argue is not a very satisfactory way, is to follow a list, very like this one, and to say, okay, well, what can the animals do? So running down the list quickly, we're looking for a criteria here to say that the animals are experiencing pain. So first of all, we need a suitable nervous system and receptor. But I would argue that actually that's what we need for nervous reception. So, so why having that, is that going to tell us about what's going on with the affected component of pain? Next, we might want to see avoidance learning associated with the noxious experience. Well, again, you can get basic forms of avoidance learning uh, in some of the examples that I showed you with, the, um, with nociception and learning. Protective motor reactions. Um, yeah, we, we saw some of that, but largely through uh, uh, nociception. Physiological changes. We're still not with an, an effective component here. Opioid receptors and evidence that reduced pain experience can be treated with things like local anesthetics and local analgesics. So maybe we're getting at something this kind of potential looks interesting. What about being able to trade off between stimuli and decide whether something is particularly aversive and you should move away from it, or maybe it's not that damaging and you need to say that. So making cognitive decisions, maybe, using higher order cognitive ability, or at least being able to switch between different motivational modes. So we might be getting at something down here that may help us, but it's a little bit waffly and a little bit gray, and how are we quite sure about what's going on with this? So as I say, this is the go-to way in which at the moment we tend to standardize thinking about pain processes and whether animals are capable of them. Um, but I think we can do better than that. Um, and I think that we need to do better than this because it's not clear to me which of the things on that list actually tell us about the effect of contaminants. And uh, it's also not clear to me why having more than one or two or three of things on the list here actually tells you any more you know, there's an idea that if you score maybe, you know, five out of six things on this list, then you feel pain. But again, I think if we look at what these different categories of things are doing for us, it's not clear that more of those are actually going to help us. So, let's come back to what we do know about uh, pain processes. And now I want to focus just a little bit on some recent uh, work about what we know about pain processes in ourselves. Because we can talk with each other and we can convince each other as best we can. Again, our, our pain is a personal pain. But I can describe the pain that I'm having to you and hopefully convince you that I am experiencing something that is noxious, that is you know, causing an emotional response within me. So what I want to show you now are a couple of pieces of evidence that um, uh, we now know, which allow us potentially to think about uh, where this effective component might actually be being processed or how it's being processed. The first thing I'll, I'll tell you about it are um, patients who have a rather rare disease, which is known as pain asymbolia. There are a number of individuals out there. They don't live for very long. Um, they um, um, may get past teenage years, but usually die fairly um, quickly uh, in their early 20s, simply because of the, uh, the fact that pain asymbolia means that the patients are aware that injuries have happened, but they don't find it unpleasant and they don't find it so somehow, or something associated with this pain and um, uh, situation, means that these, these people are not experiencing pain in terms of the effective component. And if you look at where these, the, the damage that is um, going on here associated with this particular disease, or indeed certain patients who have lesions that, that occur, so brain damage that occurs, there are two key areas in the brain that are associated with this. One is the anterior cingulate cortex, and one is the so those are areas that we could certainly look for in other animals where we might be looking to see whether we can um, uh, suggest that they have this, uh, this effective component. Interestingly though, and far more useful I think from, from our ter um, in our terms to, to show that, or, or at least for the tools which we might be able to measure something, is the fact that we can do experiments with morphine and if you provide patients with morphine and then uh, treat them in some way with a noxious stimulus, what you find is that they are actually describing its very similar response to what's going on with the pain and value of the patient. So people who have been treated with morphine will say that they uh, can describe that they're still feeling the pain, but it no longer bothers them. So they're not feeling this unpleasantness that's actually associated with that. And I think that that's a rather interesting um, key result because here what we're able to do then is to make this distinction now between what's going on with the nociception and the detection and using the, uh, these ideas here of coming out with a way to try and separate out this unpleasantness using something like um, a, a dose of morphine. 
So going back to the fish, can we use that in some way um, to, to help us now have a look at what's going on with the fish example? Here's a result that I've already shown you, this rubbing response that goes on. So what's going to happen to this rubbing response here if we now treat the fish um, with morphine? And the answer is, is that response dropped way down. So are the fish still aware of the acetic acid um, there? I'm not entirely sure, but what I do know is that, that rubbing has now decreased and stopped. Now that's kind of neat in that it looks as though there might be a way of, uh, of, of looking at, you know, trying to make some parallels here between what humans might be describing and what we're seeing in terms of behavior. But there's a big problem with this kind of experiment, which is that morphine has this um, uh, various side effects that go on, and one of the things is that it decreases behavior in general. So it's a relaxant. Individuals that, uh, that take morphine are not going to be moving in the same way. So are we getting this response here because they're just doped, if you like, and really not doing very much and not behaving? Or is this a genuine difference here between felt and unfelt pain? So we need a different kind of experiment that's going to help us look at that. So in this experiment, what we did was to, uh, we, we um, introduced an element now that made, meant that the fish had to behave in some way and, and actually be active in order to show us what they were responding to. So what we did was to use a classic novel object experiment um, by putting a novel object into the tank of the fish at a set distance from the fish. Now most fish are neophobic, so as soon as you put something new into the tank, they will move away from it. That's the classic response that you get. So here, what we were trying to um, uh, show was that in this particular experiment, we have two groups of fish, one who were treated with saline, a saline injection, one who's been given acetic acid. And this is the amount of time that the fish are spending closer to that object. So now the fish, in order to be less than five centimeters here, they've had to move towards that object. What we're thinking is going on with this result is that the fish that are experiencing that acetic acid um, uh, injection here are unable to show the normal standard of organs response that you would get in this trial because something about the experience of the pain here is in fact distracting them from the normal behavior. Now if that's true, what's going to happen now when we provide them with um, a, a treatment with morphine? Now what you see is that we get the difference between our saline and acetic acid group disappears. So maybe here again, we actually have um, a slightly better evidence uh, because now what the fish in, the, in this group is doing is now, again, keeping its distance from this object rather than drifting towards it. So if, if the morphine is taking away the hurt here, this seems to be um, this, uh, generating this reduction that we're seeing. So I think, um, and, and another way to think about this is, is that, is that what, what's happening here is, is that pain is causing distraction towards another object, but when you provide pain relief, the normal avoidance um, behavior response So I think combining these different pieces of evidence with the fish at any rate, we seem to have quite good evidence now um, about their being aware of um, that um, uh, pain state and uh, having an effective state associated with that. I'm going to change gears a little bit now and now tell you, um, uh, and, and the reason I put this picture in here is, is to help me change those gears um, and to remind me to say that everything I've been talking about within the fish <coughs> is for fish, and that the kinds of pain that we experienced, or Frida Kahlo might have experienced when she was painting self-portrait of herself, um, it, it, it is a very different, uh, more sophisticated kind of process. Our brains are more sophisticated. We have uh, many more neural pathways that are dedicated towards processing that pain. Human pain is not the same as fish pain, but that doesn't mean that the fish is not experiencing an effective component of something that is causing it to suffer. So these things are different, but I, um, uh, and, and that's really what I, I, I wanted to, to illustrate this particular picture here. Frida Kahlo um, had a, a, a very bad road a traffic accident when she was uh, just 18, which left her bedridden. She had several surgeries to try and correct the uh, damage that had been done to her spine. None of them were successful, and uh, uh, she died when she was young. She uh, took up painting whilst uh, she was bedridden, and here is one of the particular paintings, um, uh, one of her more famous paintings, uh, which is called um, uh, the uh, thorn necklace and the hummingbird. Um, quite what she's depicting in this painting, I'm not sure, but again, I think that's a rather interesting thing. This is her subjective idea that she's trying to portray here. I can only try and interpret it from this in the same way that I can't experience your pain and you can't experience my pain. We have this problem here of how we encode these things. 
Okay. So coming back to a sort of overview again, then, I think, um, I think it's rather an interesting question to say, if no perception is as widespread as it is, why is it that felt pain or effective, the effective component pain is really relatively rare? So, um, and, and why is it that not uh, some organisms are doing it and not all? It seems to, to us, uh, 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 the, the group I've been working with in, in Berlin, who I'll uh, introduce and thank at the end in my final slide, it seems to us that what that emotional bit is doing is adding the salience and is, uh, there's a real value of being aware of the pain in animals that can actually um, uh, process it in that way. And possibly reasons why this is important for pain is that interestingly, in many domains, negative emotions appear to have a very strong effect on the way that we behave. And it's true to say that the bad is stronger than the good. So in many situations of behavior, bad things that happen are more salient. So for example, bad environments during development uh, are more powerful in terms of good environments, in terms of future um, prospects and future behavior. The presence of negative social conflict um, during early development can lead to mental health issues in contrast to uh, people and animals even that are in caring and positive social environments. People report thinking about uh, bad events more than they do good events. Um, also, pessimism is a much better predictor of a health outcome compared to, say, optimists. So all you pessimists out there, you should be careful. Okay. So negative um, effects then, or sorry, negative responses to threatening harmful stimuli certainly seem to play a role in the way that we interpret and remember events and our responses to those positive events. So this idea of having this effective component on there, presumably for animals that have that capacity, makes it better uh, or, or makes it uh, a more salient experience and one that you're going to learn from more rapidly, adding to this idea that it's, it's part of an adaptive process. Okay, so um, what I, I'm uh, slightly aware of the time at the moment. The, the other thing I would like to just uh, share with you fairly quickly about work that we've been trying to do uh, as a group is to say, is, is to admit that it's still very difficult to get at which animals are um, uh, experiencing the world and, in, a, in an effective way. And uh, what are those effective states actually doing for animals? Not necessarily just through pain, but what does awareness and being aware do for the animal in general? And one of the things that is sort of an alternative approach that we're trying to come at this to just show that any animal might have feelings and emotions is to think about what that is going to lead to. And our suggestion here is that animals that uh, have awareness can behave in many more flexible ways than animals that don't. And ways in which we might be able to test this are with the, paradigm, the four paradigms that I've shown you here. So, for example, if animals can have explicit representations of absent objects, I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a minute, um, maybe it, the, the capacity to be able to do that has to, it relies on some level of awareness or consciousness in the animal. Um, we can also see that things like differential responses to the environment, again, is going to require that the animal has some level of awareness. Being able to adapt to a novel situation uh, in an effective way, again, an example of, of, of flexibility, but it requires that the animal is somehow aware. And then manipulating the environment to actually accomplish a goal. And what I'm going to argue to you is that actually we can, see, using fish, again, as the hard case or the hard, uh, um, hard example, we have examples of each of these ways to uh, tackle or solve problems in different species of fish. So in terms of having explicit representations of object, uh, absent objects, there's some wonderful, fairly old work now, but it has uh, been more recently replicated, um, about the full thing goby. It's an intertidal fish. During high tide, it learns of the topography of the area so that when the tide goes out, it knows where the rock pools will be. And it can be quite a convoluted system of rock pools, but it's mapped those out incredibly accurately so that when it's down, living in, uh, or now um, in one of these rock pools in this rather two-dimensional environment, if a predator comes along, it can hop out of the pool that it's in right now and hop into a neighboring pool. They're extremely accurate. They never hit dry ground. They jump from pool to pool to pool, as you are, um, uh, as the predator, or you with a glass rod, so inclined, um, uh, 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 chasing the, uh, the, the, the fish, and eventually it will hop out into the open ocean. Tiny fish, tiny brain, but a remarkably good spatial memory. And it's, uh, so it's able to represent its environment in the absence of actually seeing that environment. It's taking these leaps of faith in a way, although actually it's a very accurate process. Um, okay, uh, what about things like uh, a differential response to the environment? 
Cleaner fish, a wonderful example of where you get interesting dynamics happening between individuals. Cleaner fish produce, perform a service. They pay for vector parasites from uh, uh, client fish. Uh, turns out they're not always honest. And in fact, eating ectoparasites is not what they like to do. It's a rather boring pastime and it's not even very nutritious. The nutrition comes in from taking a bite, a larger bite, of mucus and skin cells from the client fish. Uh, not surprisingly, the client fish don't like this and they shudder when that happens. Cleaner fish will uh, uh, often have cues or lines of client fish waiting um, to come in and be cleaned. And the cleaner fish have to watch how much cheating and nipping they do because the client fish waiting to come in can see this juddering and they will make decisions about whether that's a reliable pair or if they're cheating very badly today and therefore you'd be better off going and waiting in line somewhere else. So you get these really interesting dynamics going on between the fish and these processes. Here we have a, 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 a really a, a, an ability to adapt to novel situations. We can get uh, really complex uh, um, logical uh, inferences built up in fish that actually perform fights. So they remember different pairs of fights that they've observed. They don't have to take part themselves. They can make observations about who's fighting who um, and then um, uh, make, uh, make decisions further down the line about um, uh, who's going to be a, a winner or a loser. And you can give them um, fights which they observe where A is greater than B, B is greater than C, C wins against D and D wins against E. And then you can put novel pairings together and say, so who's the, who's the winner in this sequence? When you put fish A against fish E, it will always choose A as being the winner and, and recognize E as the loser. Um, but maybe that's not surprising because it's only ever seen A win and it's only ever seen E lose. The more interesting comparison is when you pit fish B against fish D and say, okay, so who's going to win in this case and who not? The observer fish gets it right again. And, and, and what's neat about that is that it has seen B and D win as many number of fights as it has uh, lose the number of fights. So this, this ability to do transitive, transitive inference is pretty impressive. It's something that humans don't develop until they're about three years of age. And then my last example here is being able to manipulate the environment to accomplish goals. So tool use uh, in fish is something that's uh, uh, gathering or garnering more and more attention. Um, and uh, what you see here is a, 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 um, a tusk fish with a clam in its mouth. And I'm going to, we're running out of time, so I want to see some kind of questions. So, <coughs> um, I want to show you what this looks like. So, bearing in mind that this tool is an animal that does not have <coughs> limbs, so it doesn't have arms or legs or hands, what it's doing here is, is it's digging out a clam from the sand. It now takes it quite a long way to a particular preferred reef, which is quite hard, and it uses the same patch on the reef to do this bashing behavior, where it picks the shell up and it throws it against the rock to open the bivalve. And once it's opened it, it can get the soft flesh from inside it, and then take that off, and it swims off once it gets in. And then it can eat the flesh. It's got in there. So being able to manipulate the environment in ways that are, uh, allow these um, uh, novel outcomes is, is really quite impressive. The final example that I'll give you uh, is a little bit of clip, uh, a video clip which I definitely want to show you, which I think is one of the um, most impressive uh, examples of uh, recent discoveries of cooperative hunting behavior between two different species. So here we have the Red Sea grouper and the moray eel. And these two fish species have learned to communicate with one another and understand each other's intentions so that, what happened there? All right, you're not going to see the group in the middle. Um, really? can turn on again. I'll show you the video. All right. Um, but I really was coming to the end. What I wanted to show you was uh, this cooperative hunting that goes on between the red sea eel and the, and the, and the grouper. The um, grouper is a, a fast swimmer and it outswims it swims its prey. And often the prey fish will disappear into uh, crevices within the coral reef. What it, the grouper has learned is that at that point it's too big, it's not going to get in there. But the, um, uh, the moray eel is long and thin and can creep into crevices. 
So a grouper, when it loses a fish in the coral reef, goes and finds a moray eel, and it signals outside the eel's cave entrance. It shakes its head quite vigorously in a very specific way. The eel, if it's so inclined, will come out, and the two of them will swim off together down the reef. And then the grouper points with its snout and shows the eel exactly where the prey fish disappeared, and the eel will climb in and clamber in around the reef. And on about 50% of occasions, the prey fish that's in there goes bleh when it sees the when it sees the moray eel and it dashes back out and the grouper is ready to ambush it. But the other half of the time, the, the, the um, moray eel actually gets the fish for itself. So they share the spoils and it works out at about 50-50. Um, so we've got quite a stable behavioral interaction that goes on between these two different individuals. Really quite impressive and quite remarkable and a very interesting way in which these um, animals are um, uh, choosing to manipulate, in this case, other individuals, not aspects in the environment, but other individuals um, that are there. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so very quickly working through this. So there's a grouper that's just about to disappear over over the top here. It's, it's lost the fish. So here you see that shaking of the head to the eel. Um, this is a, a shortened clip. So they've now swum off. They've come to the part. The grouper is actually beginning to indicate where on the reef the eel should stop. It now comes down and very specifically starts to point at areas in the reef that it wants the eel to try and climb into. So it does the vertical behavior and pointing. Then it doesn't have limbs, it's trying to do this the best it can. And then uh, we see the eel climbing in around here, now trying to get in underneath where the um, eel has told it that there's a prey fish hiding. But it's trying various things. So, pulling these different pieces together, what we're trying to do with these ideas here of, of looking at these kinds of differences in, um, and versatility in behavior are um, to try and get at this question about which animals are aware. And we're interested in that. We're doing it a sort of slightly backwards way to the pain. We're interested in answering this pain question, but often it's very difficult to go directly at the pain. But if you can show that the animal is aware of processes that are occurring, then these other processes that I've told you, this, these, these two phases, the uh, stage one nociception and the second phase, the effective component of pain, seem to be much more likely. Um, so by developing this kind of framework of, of tests to look at animal awareness, we think that we're going to be moving in the right direction. And with that framework of tests, we now have the capacity, or we believe we'll have the capacity, to have a comparative series of tests that we can look at, to look at, for example, cephalopods, very intelligent animals, but do they um, experience pain? What about lobsters? There's a lot that's been written about this recently. Um, and I have some particularly gruesome uh, video footage, should anybody want to see it, of Julia Child boiling lobsters live, um, uh, uh, which uh, she did with great gusto, actually, back in the 1970s. Um, and then, you know, the lowly worm. Well, which of the processes that we've talked about this afternoon um, is the worm going to be capable of? I would argue that I don't think worms are very flexible. I think uh, these two creatures could well be. But until we actually perform those tests on them and, we, um, and try to look for this flexibility, we don't know. So my final uh, comment here then is that I think a key where we're going to be able to make some steps forward in this area is that finding behavioral flexibility in ecologically relevant, that's also important. We need to be asking questions that are relevant to the animals in the environment that they come from. Um, by asking those kinds of questions, we're going to further refine our understanding of which animals are actually able to experience things just finished by saying I'd like to thank both Dan Weary and Paula Drogi who are with me um, for the year that I'm um, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin and uh, they've been very much involved with helping me to think about some of the facts that I've talked about this afternoon. Thank you very much. Anybody want to ask any questions? Yes. So if you can do human morphine and you don't just have the animal, do they put their hand back? Or do they not respond? So the question is, is if you give a human morphine um, and then you, tr you poke them with a needle or something, do they withdraw their hand or not? Um, so I think it depends on how severely you stimulate the nociception. Um, I, don't, I haven't done the experiment, I don't know, but I would predict that if it's a very severe response, you ought to get nociception still kicking in and pulling away. 
Whereas I think if it's a long, slow press, maybe, so it's not a, not a stab as such. Um, or touching something, an area which has already had some pain response occur to it, people wouldn't necessarily withdraw at that point. They would tell you that they could feel you were touching them and, um, and that they were aware of it, but they're not, they're not actually kicking in and doing that. It's a, I think it's a, very, it's a valid point. I don't know. Yeah, we should do that. Well, we should do that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's a long question to try and repeat, but um, uh, basically the premise is what, looking at this dissociation between um, uh, the, the nociception and the pain when you use something like morphine and what is really going on with that and whether the morphine, so you, you can have patients who um, uh, still are responding but they're unconscious because they're under anesthet full anesthesia, but they're still showing some kind of, or, or that you're getting a nervous response showing that you're yeah, sometimes responsive. Yeah, so you can still see the anesthetic response. So that's kind of related to the question that we had a, a, a little while ago. So I, I agree with you, and I think we have to be a bit careful about how we use um, uh, this idea as a, um, as a, as a tool. Um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that this is um, one of the first times we've actually been able to actually go in and separate these things, which we, have, which we haven't done uh, very well before, using the, the, uh, the morphine to actually take away that effective component. So sure, when you know you still have nociception going on, um, but uh, if you have an individual that can describe to you that they're no longer experiencing the hurt anymore, that's that from a human perspective is is really quite a powerful tool with which to look at that. So trying to look at that in the fish, that's what we were doing with the experiment where you now require the fish to resume its its alertness towards something that it wasn't able to be alert to before because of what we think was a painful experience. So if you now use the morphine to actually remove potentially that hurt part, then you're getting the behavior reinstated. Do you, do you not think that that's what's going on with the... Well, you know, I, I wonder whether, whether or not... So, you know, humans, we're not going to be able to So can we really tease those apart, is what you're asking? So, so I think it's, it's difficult to know whether or not you're walking those exceptions, whether or not you're walking between the organization. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why we're coming up with trying to look at um, awareness in other ways to actually, to actually get at that. So I, yes, I, I hear what you're saying. It's a problem. Right, so, uh, um, well, I mean, uh, we talk to people who do that uh, routinely here. I mean, so what you're looking for, again, in those situations are um, behavioral indicators is the way that we classically will do that. So you're looking at, you know, in a lame cow, for example, the fact that it's, it's favoring particular limbs and not wanting to, to put pressure on the, on the area that's, uh, that's damaged. Um, yeah, I'm not, I don't, so, so uh, that's, that's what we, and, yeah, I guess you provide pain relief analgesia in different 
different ways and then look at the re resumption of the behavior to that. Um, but I'm not quite sure what you're trying to... I think it's, it's uh, the, you know, this two-stage thing where uh, these acute pains... Okay, so I, yeah, sure, up. sure. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, so yeah, I focused here because that's the way that we've designed the experiments to look at, at uh, um, acute pain responses in this way. But there, there would be, you know, you, you could set up similar paradigms to try and, and um, look at what the animals would or would not be willing to do under a chronic pain situation as well. And then you could use analgesia of one kind or another to show that you can reverse that, that process. But in the case of the chronic pain, unlike the acute pain, I think, you would tend to find that that would wear off and reverse. You know, so the, 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 the behavior that we was, you were seeing before would resume once that um, analgesic agent had um, Can you see markers of chronic pain in the brain? So, to my, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know if you have a, a, a better answer. It, but I, to my knowledge, we don't get brain damage like that in those areas. You get certain, so it depends. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of injury that leads to chronic pain. Uh, some of them are real injuries, some of them don't appear to be true injuries, it's where you've got something that's gone wrong with the nerves themselves that are actually um, overstimulated and, and, and firing. It's very difficult in many cases to go in and see those. People have tried to use lesioning to the ACC and the insula to try and relieve pain. What's interesting about that process is that when you do those lesions, you get rid of the current chronic pain, but you don't stop future chronic pains from actually occurring. So the insula and the ACC are not the only answer, there are other things that are going on there. Um, so it, even in humans, we have this, it's, it's an inherently difficult problem. Yeah, good question. <laughs> so what's going on in phantom limbs? So in phantom limbs, you're also detecting the brain is, is interpreting, you know, in a limb that's not there, various neuropathies and pains that are um, it, it, that, that are imagined, that are phantom pains, but they feel extremely real to the patient who is um, experiencing them. And there are all sorts of suggestions about. Um, uh, the, um, the regions where the nerves have been severed, um, you've got your, uh, neuropathies are actually occurring there that, that are causing those um, quite intense pains at time, which are being referred to the limb that's no longer there. Um, uh, but again, it's, it's associated with the tissue damage that has uh, then occurred within the area that you've actually caused, uh, um, produced the, uh, the amputation, sorry. And so I don't have a very good answer as to what's going on there, but I think also, you know, a lot of uh, the surgeons don't who have to try and treat patients who have chronic uh, phantom limb pain. And it's, it's a big problem for, uh, for people who have to deal with this. There's all sorts of things that, you know, sometimes you get intense itching that goes on, and there are therapies that you can do where you can use a mirror so that you can look at your regular leg, which is there, for example, and have a mirror image of it. And if you're scratching the leg, but it looks like it's coming from the phantom limb pain, it actually provides relief to that area. Andy. When you uh, <coughs> started out with sort of an evolutionary framework, I thought you were going to go in the direction of some cost benefit thing that would even say that uh, maybe stuff like short life organisms need not feel pain because they don't have much time to actually use the information yeah. or you know, some kinds of injuries in some organisms. So I think, I think you're right, and I think that one of the reasons that, um, so insects uh, seem to do, uh, be, a, be a group, classically they've got quite sophisticated behavior, they've got very impressive learning and memory capacities, but in many instances when you can, you know, you can pull a leg off a cockroach if you're so inclined, um, or you can, you know, p pinch certain aspects of them and then that they don't show uh, uh, the same kinds of responses that you do see in other invertebrates. 
insects classically are short-lived organisms. That's why I think the lobster, for example, would be an extremely interesting animal to, to, to do some work on. It's much longer lived. It's living over years. Lots of reasons in those situations for it to um, be paying much more attention to that, that it damages the living in the environment. Yeah. You, at the end, have this discussion of positive I haven't quite followed the end where, where you've gone with that. So, 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 in terms of sort of positive, you say something, I refer to it as pleasure, or some yeah. positive aspect. The really important positive aspect that might be. So, are they more important for things like reproduction? So, does positive aspects associated with reproduction out trump things like pain? Yeah. So, I, I don't know that people have done those experiments. What I. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody's actually directly trying to pit those two things off, but I, sure, it's important to try to uh, reward reproductive behavior in different ways. Um, but I still think that you will find that other negative events that may go on around the animal are associated with aspects of the um, reproductive process that, you know, if there's, if there's pain going on there at that point, I think that that would totally grab your attention and stop you from doing what you were doing. So, yeah, I'm, I, I, I think it's a, it's a universal law that the, the bad is stronger than the good. <laughs>